Terrific. Thank, there we go. thank you so much. So uh, my name is Keith Humphreys. I'm a professor at Stanford University. I'm a former um, White House drug policy advisor to President Barack Obama and President George W. Bush. And I'm speaking today as the chair of the Stanford Lancet Commission on the North American Opioid Crisis. This is a group that was founded by Lancet, which is, I believe, the world's most influential medical journal and in partnership with Stanford University, looking at the situation of the United States and Canada. And we uh, came to some conclusions about the topic that you're uh, wrestling with today. Could we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So there were 17 of us who worked for uh, 18 months, beginning in February of, of 2020. Um, is a very diverse group, so we experts in addiction medicine, biochemistry, emergency medicine, epidemiology, also experts in law in pain medicine and policy analysis. We're also diverse in terms of uh, backgrounds, uh, clinicians, researchers, educators, policymakers, also people with lived experience of chronic pain and of addiction. Go to the next slide, please. These who are commission members uh, were, um, they are all leaders in the field, in fact, also including Dr. Lemke, who was a member of the commission, who you just uh, met, includes former advisors to presidents, uh, people who have uh, led uh, very significant initi initiatives in health. We set a, a standard that for us to recommend anything, 90% of uh, the group had to agree uh, on it, and we were able to attain that in many different areas, uh, and that's not always easy to maintain, just sort of a cat herning exercise. But the things I'm going to say today were conceded by everybody, uh, supported by everybody in the commission. Please go to the next slide. So here's the simplest question is, why do we have an opioid crisis? How did this all start in, uh, in the United States and in Canada? Next slide, please. It, it came about very simply from an oversupply of drugs in the community, specifically opioids. This is data from the peak of prescribing in our two nations, which was around 2011, and compares the U.S. and Canada to every other developed nation. And what you can see is the U.S. is extremely off the chart. Canada, not quite as high, but also way off the chart. You know, four, five, six times what you see in other developed countries. And this is how it started, a uh, massive spread of opioids in the community. Now, if you go to the next slide, please. Why did this happen? This was the clinician's analysis. What opioid manufacturers claimed prior to all this and regulators conceded were the following four things. First, legally produced, clearly labeled opioids are low risk medications. Second, that being concerned about the risk of opioids is opiophobia, old fashioned. Well, you need to let that go. Third, they said public health would benefit by increased distribution of opioids. And then fourth, the controlled drugs will be consistently be taken as directed and only by the person to whom they are prescribed. We will return to these assumptions in a minute. Please go to the next slide. What turned out to actually be true? Well, first off, being legally produced and prescribed did not make these medications safe. Millions of people became addicted to them. Millions of people still are. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people died of overdose. Second, that understating the risk of opioids is dangerous. In some cases, it was criminal in case of a you know, Purdue Pharma, for example. So being worried about these drugs is not opiophobia. It is, in fact, rational. Third, that Contrary to the idea that public health would in, and safety would inherently benefit, the 400% increase in distribution of opioids in the U.S. and Canada caused, you know, trillions of dollars of damage to our countries. Last, um, the faith that controlled drugs will be taken as directed uh, was wrong. Uh, when, you, when large numbers of controlled drugs go out into the community, they are frequently diverted to other people. They may be shared, they may be stolen, they may be sold. And that spreads harm far beyond the person to whom they were prescribed. That's what happened. All those assumptions were wrong. Now, please go to the next slide. We're now in the present moment. What are safe supply advocates claiming and what are regulators such as yourself being asked to concede? These should all look familiar. Legally produced clearly labeled opioids are low risk medications. Being concerned about the risk of opioids is opiophobia. Public health would benefit by increased distribution of opioids and the controlled drugs will be consistently taken and as directed only by the person to whom they are prescribed. You can insert here whichever quote you like to use in these situations. Uh, those who forget history are condemned to repeat it. Um, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting 
a different result, or maybe we should just say, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. The fact that these same messages are being said by people who are uh, advocates not connected to the industry does not make them any more true. Please go to the next line. Here is the actual text from our commission report, which I'm happy to provide to you what we said about safe supply. Evidence clearly shows the folly of assuming that population health inherently improves when healthcare systems provide as many opioids as possible with as few regulatory constraints as possible. Policies that should attract skepticism include the dispensing of hydromorphone from vending machines and prescribing a range of potent opioids and other drugs, for example, benzodiazepines and stimulants, to individuals with opioid use disorder in the hope of creating a safe addictive drug supply. Although expressed from a public health viewpoint, these messages echo the opioid manufacturers in presuming that unrestricted opioid provision can only improve public health. The faith of some advocates that opioids are safe as long as they are not derived from illicit markets is impossible to reconcile with the hundreds of thousands of overdose deaths from legal pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical grade opioids that preceded the introduction of fentanyl into the US and Canadian heroin markets. Next slide, please. So we clearly do not have faith in this approach as a commission, but we don't despair. There are many policies that can work and can save lives, which is something everybody wants to do. There are many recommendations in the report. I will just highlight four alternatives. One is to permanently mainstream recovery-oriented addiction care within health and social care systems. Care is often underfunded. It's often fragmented. It's often not connected to the rest of the healthcare care system. If it were, that would save lives. Second, we absolutely support offering medications for opioid use disorder to all patients with, with the disorder. In other words, methadone maintenance, buprenorphine maintenance. Uh, the commission noted the evidence for these is very, very strong. Uh, they are not the same thing as just handing out opioids or, or methamphetamine or drugs in the community. They are clinical interventions and they absolutely save lives. Third, we should promote opioid stewardship in medicine. It's not just the amount of opioids, it's where they are uh, prescribed and how monitored they are. And I, I, some of the other uh, testimony have gotten into this, but just to give you an example, Germany is the one nation that, that prescribes opioids at the same level as Canada, and they do not have an opioid crisis. And you're saying, why is that so if they have the same volume of op opioids? And it's because almost all their opioid prescribing is in hospitals and other supervised settings. The difference between Canada in Germany is that there are about five times as many, or sorry, four times as many people in Canada walking around with an ambulatory opioid prescription. In other words, leaving with a bunch of pills and being unsupervised. Once you do that, you know you're gonna have spillovers into the community, into, into people to whom they were not prescribed. So it's not that you can't provide opioids. Like for example, you have hydromorphone uh, clinics under supervision in Canada. That is a really different beast than just handing the drug out and hoping for the best. Last, we can think about prevention. I mean, the, the committee talked about uh, and, and recommended investing in the healthy development of young people, sometimes through traditional prevention programs, sometimes just through programs that advance the health, particularly of kids in low-income environments, whether that's school readiness programs or uh, nurse uh, visiting programs for um, uh, moms and moms-to-be. Last slide. Thank you very much. Uh, that was the conclusions of the commission, and I'm very happy to uh, answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Humphreys. Uh, first, we have Emily Amory. Good morning, uh, Dr. Humphreys, and thank you very much for your presentation here this morning. Um, I'm looking at the executive summary on this uh, commission report, uh, the Sanford Lancet Commission was formed in response to the soaring opioid-related morbidity and mortality rates that the U.S. and Canada have experienced. In February of this year, as you had just mentioned, the Commission on the North American Opioid Crisis published Responding to the Opioid Crisis in North America and Beyond, recommendations of the Stanford Lancet Commission. And I understand that you were the author of this report. With respect to safe supply, the report indicated that po policies that should attract skepticism include the dispending of hydromorphone from vending machines and providing a range of potent opioids and other drugs to individuals with opioid use disorder in the hopes of creating a safe addictive drug supply. 
In addition to that, doctor, it's further indicated that the faith of some of the advocates that opioids are safe as long as they are not derived from illicit markets is impossible to reconcile with the hundreds of thousands of overdose deaths from legal pharmaceutical grade opioids that preceded the introduction of fentanyl into US and Canadian markets. Now, I'm wondering if you can comment to this committee, um, whether it be in your personal experience or whatever you may have encountered uh, throughout your studies uh, and, and in creating this report, whether those who did receive safe supply opioids were still acquiring drugs from illicit markets and whether there was a corresponding increase in the rate of addictions and overdose in these safe supply jurisdictions that you analyzed. Thank you uh, for that question. And I do want to clarify that the, although I was the leader of the commission, all 17 of us uh, uh, wrote the report together. So it reflects the opinion of a broad group of people. It is definitely true that even people in, you know, high quality treatment programs, you know, like, you know, buprenorphine clinics still use um, other drugs, you know, um, you know, it varies on the rate, but it's not unusual at all to see people also, for example, using some opioids on top of, as they say, or using cocaine and so on. Um, the critical difference with safe supply is the use by people who are not patients in the clinic. So, you know, someone mentioned a study earlier of, you know, following 17 people who are given drugs in the community and evaluating how many of them are still using fentanyl. Um, we have to remember that anyone they shared those drugs with anyone who may have started an addiction with those drugs, anyone who may have died from those drugs would not be in those kinds of studies. So that literature is silent about the expanding risk, which we know for a fact, it is not hypothetical, that when we flood communities with drugs, that they spread beyond the person who gets the actual prescription. And so there's no way to assess, and that is a weakness in safe supply studies, is because they don't admit the possibility that someone else could be harmed, they don't measure the possibility. But the fact they chose not to do that doesn't mean that it isn't there. Supplemental? Nope. Uh, Emily Rosen. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for your presentation today uh, on the report, which was actually referenced by someone earlier in our week of deliberations. Uh, it's great to actually have you here as chair and as the author of that report. Um, I think it's interesting something you said because one of the most common arguments in favor of safe supply from proponents of the, such a program uh, is that it is, it is a harm reduction tool. And individuals who are not ready to take that step into, their, into a better future and receive treatment can at least have harm reduced through uh, provision of safe opioids. But you said something profound, which I thought was in stark contrast to that, which was that safe supply spreads harm. Uh, which is essentially the entire opposite of what, what proponents of uh, safe supply would normally argue. So I'm just curious what you would say uh, to individuals and about that claim that safe supply is a harm reduction tool. Well, harm reduction is a empirical claim. I mean, you, you know, if I just call something harm reducing, I have to show you evidence that harm is in fact lower. So if it is true that distributing, say, OxyContin widely uh, reduced harm or would reduce harm, why did all these people die? All the evidence shows that, you know, um, that we had a, a surge in overdose rates. So that it's just claiming that label, but providing no evidence that harm is in fact reduced. We also know that even, you know, people, if you, if you were in a household where someone prescribed OxyContin, a different person in the household, your risk of developing addiction went up, whether that was a kid going through the medicine cabinet or somebody, you know, visiting the home, uh, you know, relatives taking those drugs as well, that, you, that you, would, you cause more harm so that the person who is the patient becomes the vector for more people to become addicted. So there's just, you know, in, in science, we have to actually show evidence to declare that something is harm reducing. Just like, you know, we don't say, I provide effective treatment. I don't, I don't call it effective until I see that, in fact, it is. And I think the bar has been set too low here, that just labeling something as harm reduction it implies that there's strong evidence that it reduces harm. We don't have that proof at all. Would you argue that safe supply potentially does the opposite of reduce harm? It, it entirely could. We, as I mentioned, because the, you know, when people are very enthusiastic about something, they usually design studies in such a way it's hard for negative effects to show up. 
So I do not, I cannot prove one way or the other because it hasn't been studied whether there is any diversion. But just think, if we just think about it fairly rationally, if we, if we get to the point where if I go to a clinic and I say I need, you know, 30 days of uh, hydromorphone and 30 days of crystal methamphetamine and 30, 30 days worth of benzodiazepine, the odds that I will take all that myself are pretty low. Uh, I will probably share some of it. I may sell some of it. And that can include two people who are not addicted. And so their addiction, it, you know, the rate of addiction goes up because of these safe supply programs. I could also share drugs or sell drugs to people who don't have my level of tolerance. And while I could take that combination of drugs, they can't and they die. Those are real risks. And they're not, you know, they're not hypothetical. This happened all the time during the opioid crisis that prescriptions went to people other than to whom they were prescribed. And the fact that that hasn't even been considered says to me that there, people are too much trapped in enthusiasm and not willing to do the careful testing to make sure that what they're doing is not going to do more harm than good. Thank you. I have one further question. One other claim made by proponents of safe supply often is that we have more of a drug poisoning crisis than we have an addictions crisis. <coughs> Sorry. So I am wondering if through uh, the Lancet Report's studies and research, if they found any statistics related to um, the ratio of those who overdose from a drug poisoning versus just from an ordinary overdose, uh, whether intentional or not intentional, or, or they survive or they don't. Just, yeah, is there any data of either yes. way? So we have, we have seen a transition of uh, overdoses since this all started that now they are primarily um, from synthetic opioids like fentanyl. Although if we call them all poisoning, we are sort of assuming that no one is using fentanyl intentionally, which is probably uh, not the case. Um, the, the, there's still, though, an addiction crisis. I mean, you know, saying addiction isn't a big deal uh, makes sense unless you've ever been addicted or known somebody who is. And, you know, it, it's a very unpleasant state to be in. It has high morbidity uh, uh, apart from the risk of mortality. It's very hard on families. It's very hard on communities. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't dismiss it. Um, and there are, and last to say, there are plenty of smart things we can do about overdose. Just to take one thing, the Lancet's model shows that widespread provision of naloxone, the opioid uh, rescue medication, is the number one policy that would greatly reduce opioid overdoses. So it's not as if we are powerless um, to um, respond to this apart from just handing out more opioids as we did during the, the first wave of this crisis. Emily Milliken. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Humphreys, for being here uh, and for your presentation. I'm going to make my questions, uh, I think, pretty, um, pretty direct, I guess is the best way to put it. I've asked uh, several uh, individuals who have presented to us um, something of a similar vein, so I'll ask it to you as well. Um, is there any evidence that uh, safe supply policies that have been implemented in jurisdictions, is there any evidence that they decrease the rate of addiction and or lethal or non-lethal overdose? No. No, the evidence is nowhere near at that level, in part because of this challenge of not looking beyond the person enrolled in the program. So we cannot make that claim. Thank you. Uh, second, uh, is a very similar question. Uh, is there any evidence that safe supply policies implemented in jurisdictions, as we've seen, uh, increases the rate of addiction and or lethal or non-lethal overdoses? I don't think we know the answer to that question. Okay. Um, can I ask one more? Just uh, yep. Your uh, presentation had an interesting part to it. In your recommendations, the four, I'm going to pull it up on this. Uh, your fourth actually talked about something that we haven't, uh, it's the first time that, that uh, I think I've heard um, this as one of the potential um, ideas with regards to uh, policy recommendations. And that was on the fourth one was to invest in a healthy development of young people. Uh, I'm curious, uh, I, I'm not in any way, shape or form trying to dispute that. It seems pretty logical on its face. But again, we've talked a lot about uh, evidence and data. Have we got any jurisdictions, perhaps in America, where they've implemented policies like this? And has that uh, led to um, any sort of statistical advantage with regards to opioid use in those general areas? 
Yeah, so we, we're talking about long-term investments, uh, first off. So it, th these are not things that will show up in, in 12 months, but you can look at both um, well-evidenced uh, prevention programs like Communities That Care is, a, is a, a good example that strengthen basic capacities in kids, like the ability to recognize and manage emotion, to exercise behavioral self-control, and to form positive connections with other people. And those have long-term benefits in terms of reduced smoking, drinking, use of drugs, and also lots of other things that we worry about with kids, like lower rates of depression, lower rates of getting involved with crime, lower rates of, of flunking out of school. We also know that if you go further back in development um, to things like um, uh, for low-income mothers, nurse family partnership, which is a program that sends uh, a, um, uh, a nurse out to take care of uh, mom through uh, prenatal care and then stay with her through the for the early time of becoming a, a parent that in randomized studies kids in those programs have lower rates of drug use decades later so you know we we need to think long term one of the things about i mean overdose is terrible and we all want to reduce it but you know we have to think long term it's just like we can't deal with heart disease by just putting up the paddles available to give a shock to someone who's have a heart attack. Of course, you want to save that person. But we'll never end the epidemic if we just let the cases accrue and deal with the very severe problems only. You have to think preventively. That's how we get rid of all epidemics. And that's why we say it's so important to make those investments up front so that we are all not sitting here um, older and sadder uh, 20 years from now still grappling with a problem like this. Emily Yao. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you, Dr. Humphreys, for taking the time to speak with us. Um, I was just hoping you could just clarify some comments that you made earlier. Um, you referred to the uh, opioid epidemic of the n late 1990s. That is a well-studied, well-documented, and acknowledged by every uh, agency that that was truly an epidemic and, and uh, it, again, well-studied. Are you, with the, with the push for uh, the concept or various definitions of what safe supply is, you indicated, and if you could just clarify that by pushing that agenda that we are demonstrating that we truly haven't taken the lessons that we had from the opioid epidemic of uh, the 1990s. Thank you. Yes, that is absolutely correct. I could take lines out of some things that have been written advo advocating for safe supply and shift them with, uh, replace them with lines from marketing for Oxycontin by Purdue Pharma 25 years ago. It is the same message of, you know, the more opioids, the better. These are safe. Stop being such a fuddy duddy. Stop worrying. Let's give these out. Good things will result. Um, we should learn the lesson of his very recent history um, that that is not a good way to promote population health. No follow up. Thank you. Emily Stefan. Hi, uh, thank you very much for speaking to the committee today. Uh, a question I had is I'm wondering if you had looked at how expensive it is to pursue uh, safe supply as policy. Uh, I know for every dollar that we spend as a government on uh, one policy, we may take away a dollar to be spent on another policy uh, in the area of addiction. For example, safe supply dollars may otherwise be used for addiction recovery services. I'm just wondering if you looked at how expensive a safe supply type of policy would cost. Thanks, Thanks for that question. We didn't do economic modeling of that policy, uh, but I will say that your fundamental logic is is correct. Um, you know, if I know a previous speaker mentioned, you know, there is a significant budgetary commitment in the Canadian budget towards this. That money could have been spent on treatment and recovery. So sometimes when I hear people say we need to do this because it will get people into treatment and recovery, I wonder though, wouldn't you get even more people in if you actually spent that money on treatment and recovery? It's just a perspective. Supplemental. Emily Sigurdsson. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Dr. Humphreys, for your presentation. I just um just when you were speaking, you were answering Emily Milliken's question. You kind of a, talked about um, something of as far as long-term strategies and investing in the future, and you kind of commented on the fact that, you know, we got to look at this in a broad view, and I don't think any of us deny that something needs to be done, but what that should look like. 
um, is very important to all of us. And I guess uh, my question will revolve around um, basically in your experience, what do you think the chief criteria should be surrounding um, any, any drug programs in the future and determining the effectiveness and the success of that program. Do you have any advice that you can provide to us to, to what that really should look like so that we can measure the success of what, what we're doing moving forward? So one of the key points of the commission is that opioids are not good or bad. Um, you know, they, there is a role for them. We would not want to have medicine without them. They have many, many uses and benefits. So, you know, our policy towards them should, first off, secure adequate supplies of opioids for those who need them. Second, it should not be initiating people on opioids who do not need them, which happened quite a bit. And then third, it should improve population health. So that would be both uh, functional uh, functionality, well-being, as well as risk of other types of illnesses and uh, premature mortality. Those things all together we have to keep in mind. Um, we also do also have to consider public safety because uh, addiction, unlike say high blood pressure, does often have externalities. People do things they would not otherwise do. Some of those things threaten public safety. And so we want a policy that also protects people who do not use drugs um, from behavior that people might engage in while they are using drugs. Supplemental. Yes, thank you, Chair. And I guess when when you're explaining that, I, I mean, it harkens back to what you had mentioned before about uh, when we go down this road of safe supply, that there is an expanding risk uh, component there that's definitely needs to be looked at and considered. And, and maybe this is putting you on the spot a little bit, but when it comes to that and you look at it overall, um, would you be willing to comment on what you think the ethical concerns are when it comes to moving forward with something like safe supply? Sure. And I, and I will just be speaking for myself because we didn't go into deep, this deeply as a commission. My, my uh, worries are several. One, that we are underestimating the capacity of people to recover. So we can give them a bunch of uh, pills and send them away rather than engage them in a meaningful way and see if they would like a different kind of life and whether we would be willing to help them find that kind of life, which may take more effort and may take more money, but is doing right by them ethically. Second, I worry about the expanding uh, um, scope of where drugs will go. I mean, I have seen people argue in this area that you know, basically on the basis of attestation, I should be able to get, you know, fentanyl and crystal meth and benzodiazepines. And I, we just know from the prior experience that's going to go to other places. What are we going to do when someone comes in and says, my, my friend, my husband, my wife, my son is dead because he got drugs from someone else that came from a doctor that they said they were giving out in forms of safe supply? What is that physician going to say? What is the government going to say about why they spent the money that way to, to introduce more people to drugs that are potentially lethal? I, those are really tough questions to grapple with that I have not seen uh, addressed to this point. Emily Milliken. Uh, sure. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for being here again today and mindful of the time. Um, I'm struck by the report in the sense that it seems to have gone down what a lot of us have been dealing with throughout, uh, throughout this committee on an evidence-based, almost like a qualitative side of things. And it seems like of, your, of your, uh, the, the four points that come out of the report, two are sort of uh, quantitative, two are qualitative. Um, and that's that qualitative, uh, sorry, the quant yeah, the qualitative side of things uh, hasn't been discussed quite as much, but I think you kind of answered a bit of it with regards to uh, Emily Sigurdsson's. So I'll just give you a quick opportunity. Uh, through your research and experience on this, um, have you seen a jurisdiction that has inputted safe supply and done so in a way that has led to a safe result? No, I, I don't think we have evidence at all that this has a net benefit for communities. Um, and, you know, and I suspect we will not get it because the people who are pushing it are, haven't designed evaluations in such a way that they would even detect those kinds of problems. Excellent. Well, that uh, concludes our time for questions and answers today. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time, uh, Dr. Humphreys, uh, to share with us today for your presentation and your work in this field. So thank you so much for, for being here today. Thank you very much for having me.